Buongiorno. I'm Alison Cornish. I'm chair of the Department of Italian Studies here in New York. And um, I am uh, glad to be welcoming our colleague, Lina Bolzoni, who is uh, both a professor at uh, the Scuola Normale of Pisa and um, is also a global distinguished professor here in the Department of Italian Studies at NYU. And uh, when she comes to teach, she also comes to give a public lecture. So um, today we're doing it virtually. Hopefully our next one will be in person. And to introduce uh, Professor Bolzoni, uh, I have my colleague Eugenio Raffini, who is uh, currently in Rome at the American Academy of Rome, where he is a fellow. And he is here to introduce um, Professor Bolzoni. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Alison. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm really delighted to be introducing today's guest, Professor Lina Bolzoni, who is joining us from Pisa. Um, in fact, I have to say that I'm not only delighted, but also honored uh, for Professor Bolzoni is one of the leading scholars in the field of Renaissance studies. One of those big names that come up in bibliographies all the time across the globe, and it is really exciting to have her with us today. Another more personal reason for being both delighted and honored, um, if I may, is that she is my former advisor, someone from whom I've learned a lot and I continue to learn a good deal. So it will be very long to review her career and achievements. Uh, so I will just recall a few remarkable facts. Uh, Lina Bolzoni is Professor Emerita at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, where she has taught Italian literature for many years and where she has mentored numerous students who then became scholars. And I insist on this point because her scholarship and her mentorship have always been going hand in hand with the idea that it is through collegial exchange at all levels that knowledge is better made and critiqued. Uh, and this is one of her teachings that I cherish the most. So she is a pioneer in the interdisciplinary study of the Renaissance. Uh, she has devoted most of her work to the intersections of rhetorical culture, literature, poetry, and the figurative arts. Among her most famous titles, I will limit my listing here to her essays published with um, the Italian publisher Einaudi. This is a series of four uh, extremely important contributions. La Stanza della Memoria of 1995, La Rete delle Immagini of 2002, Il Cuore di Cristallo, 2010, and finally Una Meravigliosa Solitudine, 2019, many of which have been translated into several languages. Other important works of hers include recently two edited volumes published by Treccani, the Istituto dell'Enciclopedia Italiana, on the visual reception of both Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, 2014, and Dante's Divina Commedia, 2021. She's a regular of numerous international institutions. She has held visiting professorships worldwide, including in the States. She's been at UCLA, at Harvard, both in Cambridge and at Villa Itatti in Florence, and above all at NYU, where she has been a constant presence over many years in her capacity as global distinguished professor. Um, as Alison recalled, uh, she was with us recently in the fall of 2021, though remotely, um, and we can't wait to have her back in person in fall 2022. Among the many prestigious awards and honors she has received, let me just mention that she's a fellow of the British Academy, as well as a Socia Nazionale of the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei. So I apologize with Professor Bolsoni for this summary, which really uh, can't do justice to her actual uh, curriculum vitae. Um, and without further ado, I leave our virtual podium to her. Um, her talk today is entitled The Art of Reading and the Studiolo of Urbino. Grazie, Lina. Thank you very much, Eugenio. Thank you, Elison. It's a great pleasure for me to come back uh, to NYU, to the Italian department, even if only online. And uh, I begin my lecture 
On uh, 6 December 1864, John Raskin, an English art critic who influenced the Predefined Lights, gave a public lecture in Manchester. The title was uh, Sesame and Lilies. Just as in the Arabian Nights, Sesame is the magic word that opens the door to the treasure of the 40 thieves. So for Raskin, he would lead his public into the library to books, which for men are, he says, the real treasure. In France, Raskin had one exceptional admirer and translator, Marcel Proust. Between 1904 and 1906, uh, he translated Raskin talk at uh, a difficult juncture in his own life following the death first of his father and then of his mother in 1905. Proust's work on uh, uh, Sesame and Lilies is much more than a translation. We feel him engaging in a sort of challenge, wrestling with the text, which he flanks with notes that at crucial moments become extraordinarily long and with an introduction on the reading, notes sur la lecture. This begins with an evocation of those childhood days when reading a favorite book was a precious, a precious treasure snacked from the daily routine of family life, defended against the assault of intruders, hidden in accessible recesses, consecrated to solitude. And here we find a beautiful definition of reading. I quote, this wonderful miracle of reading, which is communication in the heart of solitude. And uh, Proust says then, we, uh, when we read, we are alone, but it's a solitude populated, populated by the voices of the authors. He writes, one receives the thought of another mind while all the time engaged in a personal activity. We are that other person, and yet all the time we are developing our own personality with more variety than if we thought alone. We are driven by another on our own ways." End of quote. I would like to begin with this beautiful definition given by Proust and to go back in time to the Renaissance tradition that represents the experience of reading as a dialogue with the author, reading as a dialogue with books, an encounter with the authors who gave life to them. Since these authors often belong to the past, our theme may be usefully renamed Reading as a Dialogue with the Dead, a form of lay resurrection or a necromantic rite to use an image dear to Thomas Green. It's a long and challenging tradition, a tradition where reading is a shared experience, but at the same time, something absolutely intimate and personal a journey wherein, uh, wherein meeting the other, one recognizes one's own self. A life-giving experience that offers hospitality to an unknown guest, and for this very reason, is at once fascinating and dangerous. It's a voyage to the outermost bounds of time and space. Petrarch, for example, took great care in constructing an image of himself as a reader. His work might even be regarded as a unique analysis of the different kinds of pleasure which reading affords, a record of the subtle variety of effects produced by the different ways in which it may be practiced. And we uh, can read uh, a passage from a, a letter to Giovanni dell'Incisa. I can never satisfy my hunger for books, and perhaps I already own more than I should. But with books, it's just the same as with other things. The more we obtain what we have been looking for, 
the more our greed is stimulated. In fact, there is something special about books. Gold, silver, precious stones, purple robes, palaces of marble, and all other such things give a silent and superficial pleasure. Books, instead, please inwardly. They speak with us and confer with us. They attach themselves to us. That is, with a lively and penetrating familiarity." End of quote. The pleasure of reading is, Petrarch feels, more intimate and more intense than the satisfaction afforded by other worldly goods. Its joy, which reaches the marrow itself, is the joy of a conversation. Its pleasure stems from the dialogue a book sets up with its reader. I quote, the books attack themselves to, the, to us, that is, with a lively and penetrating familiarity. And familiarity is a very important word. In this tradition, books create a friendship. They create a community. What is particularly relevant is also the way Petrarch rearticulates the theme of speaking books so that this becomes a focal point in his portrayal of himself as a reader writer. In doing so, he also accomplishes the task of importing the models of orality and, in, and, and interpersonal exchange into the heart of modern book culture. We may see this strategy as implicitly answering the accusations leveled by Platus Phaedrus against the written text, branded as an artificial repository of memory, fixed and ideological. In the tradition that Petrarch crucially contributed to establishing, the book speaks dialogues with its reader. But how this become possible? Under what condition can this magic be realized? At the root of the magical reading, the element that enables dialogue and indeed an almost personal encounter with an author is the capacity of the text to represent its writer's soul. I mean, the idea of the text as a speculum animi, a mirror of the soul, a truthful portrait of the interiority. In the famous letter, Petrarch addressed to Boccaccio in 1359, the poet recalls their first meeting, which took place in 1350, when Petrarch was on his way to Rome. He cannot forget, and I, I show you the quotation, he cannot, for, uh, he cannot forget, he says, that before meeting him, Boccaccio sent him some of his poems. You thus, I quote, reveal to me whom uh, you had determined to love, first the face of your talent and later that of your person. The game of correspondences which emerges from Petrarch's words is based on the idea of the text as the face, vultum, of the soul. We see here a reworking of the topos of the book as a mirror, duly recorded by Curtius in his archive of European literary memory. Petrarch gives a new life to this idea by suggesting there exists a reciprocal relationship between inside and outside, between the text and the body. The text makes visible what lies hidden in the interior, and through this unveiling, the act of reading also uh, almost becomes a personal encounter. It allows the reader to sum up the person read, to see, as it were, the feature of the other soul in his or her mind's eye. We find this idea in a very long tradition. For example, in Giovanni Francesco Pico della Mirandola or Erasmus of Rotterdam. But it's important to underline that this idea of the text as a speculum animi is part of the way in which poets and writers claim their superiority 
over the figurative arts. It's a component of the statement that words are superior to images. And uh, I come, and I come, sorry, <laughs> to my second point. According to an ancient hierarchical distinction, while an image can only represent a face and must therefore stop at the surface, the written word can faithfully reflect the soul of the subject being represented. Between book and portrait, a complex game is played out, the relationship teeming with analogies, but also reciprocal competition and negation. Behind the hierarchy between text and images, there was something in the tradition of reading as a dialogue with the authors that pushed the two components to collaborate. If reading means meeting with the author, it means evoking his features and presence with an, with an almost physical intensity, then the presence of his or her portrait will help the fulfillment of the right, and words and images will support each other. The link between writers' portraits and speaking books was already visible in a passage from Pliny's uh, Naturalis Historia, in which a Hellenistic custom newly imported to Rome is described. I, I quote, we must not pass over a novelty that has also been invented in that likeness made are set up in the libraries in honor of those whose immortal spirits speak to us in the same places, nay more, even imaginary likenesses are modeled and our affection gives a birth to the portraits that have, not, uh, that have not been handed down to us as occurs in the case of Homer." End of quote. If soul speaks true books, the, uh, the need to see the shape of the desired object is also prompted by them. And this helps the production of imaginary portraits spurred on by the desire to give Homer recognizable features, to really see his face, this desire would, over the course of the centuries, be one of the fundamental drives in the creation of many a false, a false likeness. In the classical world, the tradition of portraits in library probably started in the libraries of Alexandria and Pergamon. Pliny sees in this an example of the passionate love of portraits that existed in antiquity. Imaginum amorem flagra secondum, he writes. The ancient model find in Quattrocento, in the 15th century, a particular fortune. The tradition that exalts the man of arms is intertwined with that which exalts the man of letters, and their portraits adore the, the places, I mean the libraries, the studiolo, that host the books and collection. This is the case of Lionello d'Este, as Angelo de Cembrio tells us, or of Pietro de' Medici, described by Filarete, while enjoying the precious manuscripts and portraits of illustrious men preserved in his studiolo. But, there is a place where we may still see from close up just how the theater of reading comes alive. How is possible to become immersed beyond the boundary of time in an ideal world where one may rediscover and rebuild the self? This is the studiolo of Federico da Montefeltro in Urbino. We shall approach it as uh, if in a game of Chinese boxes, guided by the memory of Castiglione Scortegiano. He writes, Duke Federico built on the uh, rugged site of Urbino, a palace which many believe to be the most beautiful in Italy. And uh, he furnished it so well and so appropriately that it seemed not a palace, but a city in the shape of a palace. 
non un palazzo, ma una città in forma di palazzo, e se pareva. The studiolo is situated within this palace city, mirroring in its space the interplay of perspectives Castiglione in Sat between microcosm and macrocosm. Its intarsios and its paintings referencing the library, the musical instruments, and the military and political career of the Duke. The quotation of a part, as it were, evoking the whole. It's a sort of misanabim of all that makes the palace great, but filled through the lens of the prince's unique and personal view, making it, in many ways, an ideal portrait of Federico. Particularly important is the link between the studiolo and the Federico's library, which benefited from his great personal care and a significant financial outlay. While the volumes collected before 1464 are fewer than 100, but at Federico's death, the library counted around 900 codexes, 600 in Latin and Italian, 168 in Greek, 82 in Hebrew, and two in Arabic. The library was in a hall to the left of the entrance in the, to the Palazzo Ducale, in the main courtyard. Throughout the century, it had remained almost intact. It was bought by Pope Alexander VII and is now housed as part of the Vatican Library. Federico Studiolo is a small, irregularly shaped room. We see the image. Uh, on the first floor, the Piano Nobile, at the heart of the Duke's apartment, it occupies a space half away between the public and the private rooms. The small space of the studiolo expands uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, into multiple dimensions through the variety and position of the intarsia panels and painting that cover its uh, walls. On the upper level, a wooden board is inscribed with the date 1476 and with the heraldic symbols of the Duke. On the intermediate level, disposed along two parallel lines, are 28 portraits of illustrious men, realized by Justus van Gent and Pedro Berruguete. In this way, the studiolo reflects and in a way condenses the library. The famous men are also the authors of the works it preserves. Many of the portraits that we see in the studiolo reappear in the manuscript initials of the codexes containing their works. The intercess reproduces reproduce the space itself of the library and the object that inhabited it. While in many ways the studiolo has remained miraculously untarnished by time, the part on which, uh, on which I wish to focus my attention has greatly suffered its ravages. In 1632, a year after the devolution of the Duchy of Urbino to the Holy See, Pope Urban VIII gave his nephew Antonio Barberino the studiolo paintings, which had, had been detached from the walls and deprived of the accompanying inscriptions. Now the portraits are divided into two groups, a set of 14 are in the National uh, Gallery in the Palace of Urbino. The other group passed on to uh, the Louvre. Before the dismantling of the upper level of the studiolo, a uh, German scholar, Laurentio Schrader, at the end of the 16th century, transcribed the inscription. And uh, in 2015, an exhibition reassembled these scattered limbs celebrating for the brief space of a few months the return of the illustrious man to the court of Urbino. Let us now enter the studiolo and bring it fully back to life by putting back all the portraits that were present in it, 
calling back to Urbino, as it were, almost those that are currently housed in the Louvre and accompanying it with his own inscription. inscription. The aim of this reconstruction is to understand how the studiolo worked as a whole, how portraits and descriptions interacted with Federico, how in particular they contributed to the functions that studiolo was called upon to perform. That is not only self-representation and self-celebration, but also reading, meditation, and perhaps even writing. What is immediately striking is the variety of the portraits, of the clothes and the faces, and the faces depicted, but especially of the attitudes and gestures. Such variety and vivacity mark a move away from the traditional representation of illustrious men from which they undoubtedly stem. The paintings accentuate the theatrical idea of a living presence. The specific layout of the portraits and the uh, overall meaning of the iconographic program has been much discussed. What is certain is that the pagan and the Christian wolves are both represented. The literary taste and the pedagogical ideals of modern humanism cohabit serenely with uh, eulogies for the protagonist of scholastic philosophy. Literature and science, law and theology are represented through the likeness of their most exemplary interpreters. The gallery reconstructs an encyclopedia within the mind, an encyclopedia mediated by the tastes and the personal experience of Federico. There is one element common to all the portraits. All the figures are holding a book. The only exception is Ptolemy that we see on the left, who is holding an astrolabe in his left hand, while another uh, scientific instrument, the compass, features next to a book in the portraits of uh, Euclides. So it's primarily on the book that the construction of knowledge is based. Supplemented in some cases, as for example in mathematics, geography, or astronomy, by scientific instruments. Some of the books in the portraits may be open, so to allow us to view the pages, like in Plato or St. Augustine. In other portraits, the book is closed. In some cases, like in Boetius, you, you can see the portrait on the left of Thomas Aquinas, uh, the closed book is accompanied by the gesture of the hand, of the hands, a very important gest, a gesture that indicates the disputatio, the discussion of an argument. Looking down from the walls of the studiolo, therefore, was a gallery of authors, readers, the book is a constant feature in the portraits, but the minute variation in the way it is represented graphically express different moments in the reading process. The gesture from the more sedate to the more excited breathes life into the figures, showing the different ways in which grand men of the past and present from the classical and the Christian worlds communicate their wisdom to Federico and to those who frequented the studiolo. The dialogue with the wise men in the portraits was not, however, a one-way exchange. This is shown clearly by the inscriptions that originally accompanied the portraits. Here Federico features as the main protagonist of this pictorial enterprise. It was he who desired and commissioned the portraits, uh, the portraits and oversaw their placement. For example, we uh, can uh, read uh, Federicus di Cavit, Federico dedicated, who is below Plato, or Federicus Poswit, Federico placed below Aristotle, Boetius, Cicero. The message is a very specific one, 
Federico was paying homage to these great men, but also thanking them, moved by a strong sense of admiration and gratitude. It is, in other words, an act of justice. Gratitude, however, is not the only sentiment that appears to animate Federico. As the director of this iconographic enterprise, he wished to be indirectly portrayed himself through these inscriptions as a passionate, but also a careful reader, capable of expressing critical and moral opinion. So uh, we find a formula, X and uh, an abstract noun, that is used to represent the effects produced by the work of those whose portraits are displayed. Ex persuasione is used in the case of Cicero, master of the art of persuading, as well as being father of the motherland. This formula is also used in those cases in which Federico more clearly saw himself as mirrored in the works of the wise men whose portraits he had commissioned and from whom he drew examples and encouragement for his own actions as a ruler. We see this in the case of Solon, uh, you see the portrait on the left, the author of the Athenian laws uh, on which the Roman legal system was modeled. Federicus Poswit, we read, ex studio bene instituendorum civium. Federico placed this on account of his desire to rightly orient the citizens. And in the case of Bartolo da Sasso Ferrato, you see uh, the portrait on the, on the right, an uh, impartial interpreters of the law, and we read Federico Poswit ex merito et justitia. The ethical trust of the portraits was accompanied by, uh, by brief but significant interpretative glosses. Almost, we may venture, footnotes in a larger book. Plato and uh, Aristotle, okay, Plato and Aristotle were placed side by side, but are viewed in different lights. Plato is the authority in the field of human and divine philosophy, while Aristotle is praised mainly for his method. Posuit ex latitudine of philosophiam rite ex atteque stravitam, uh, placed out of gratitude for having passed on philosophy in the due and exact manner. And uh, we have also Dante and Petrarch, and they are the representatives of modern poetry. But while uh, Dante is uh, praised for the way in which his poem in the vernacular transmitted a vast amount of knowledge to wide public, Petrarch is described as the poet whose words communicate sweetness and pleasure. The contemporary world is represented in the gallery by Sixto IV, whose philosophical and theological wisdom is celebrated, as well as his recent ascent to the papal throne. Strong political connections justified this. In 1474, Federico had received from the Pope the title of Duke. A more, a more personal note is sounded in the praise of Seneca, the teacher of Stoic serenity and in the words dedicated to Pius II, celebrating his skills in both warfare and eloquence, an interplay of arms and letters in which Federico evidently recognized facet of himself. With Sistus uh, IV and Pius II, therefore, contemporary characters enter the gallery of portraits of illustrious men, an innovative and highly personal take on tradition. The theme of personal friendship emerges in the place of Bessarion, you see the portrait on the left, who is remembered primarily for his attempt to recon reconcile the Eastern and Western churches. The two men shared a love of books. Bessarion had entrusted to Federico the precious coffers containing his manuscript. 
and Federico, keeping the promise made to his friend, delivered them in 1474 to the secretary of the Signoria of Venice. Another particularly moving and personal inscription commemorates Vittorino da Felce. You see uh, the uh, portrait on the left. Federico's teacher. Uh, uh, we read the inscription. Federico dedicated to his most holy teacher, Vittorino da Felce, because of the learning and humanity which he passed on through writing and example, end of quote. Vittorino embodied the true spirit of humanitas, an interpretation of life and doctrine. He is the teacher who was known as the Christian Socrates. Federico had not forgotten how formative had been those adolescent years which he had spent at Vittorino's school. Between the ages of 12 and 14, Federico had studied at the Cagioiosa, the school of Vittorino, where particular case was bestowed at the individual propensities of each pupil through games, physical exercise, and music, as well as through a syllabus in which mathematics and letters were taught together with drawing and the natural sciences. Indeed, just at the fond memory of Vittorino, hovered around his portrait, so did the example of his method live on in the very structure of the studiolo. So the portraits of the illustrious men, the inscription that accompanied them and their placement along the upper level of the studiolo constitute a living and highly personalized theater of memory, a memory that selected the treasures held in the library and gave its authors not just a face, but a liveness of expression and gesture that almost invited them to participate in the creative dialogue of reading, writing, and meditation. The authorities belonging to these great authors, from both antiquity and modernity to the classical and crystal worlds, was certainly the foundation on which this dialogue was built. But it was also a a two-way exchange with someone like Federico, capable of judging and selecting, of viewing those exemplary personages from a very specific angle, a man who could both see himself reflected in them and use them to first build and later reinforce his identity as a scholar and a prince. Federico most certainly agreed with the exalted praise of reading that we find in the famous letter which his friend Bessarione had written to the Doge of Venice, Cristoforo Moro, in whose hand he left his Venetian library. And I quote, there is no object more precious, no treasure more useful and beautiful than a book. Books are full of the voices of the wise. They live, dialogue, and converse with us, inform, educate, and console us. They show us that things belonging to the remote past are in fact present. They place them before our very eyes. Without books, we should all be brutes. And uh, I would like to end my lecture with a quote from uh, Virginia Woolf. In 1925, in an essay based uh, on a talk given at the girls' school in Kent, Woolf had urged women readers to become friends of the authors whose book they were reading, so that they could later become judges. And she concluded with a splendid eulogy of reading. I quote, I have sometimes dreamed, dreamt at least, then when the day of judgment, the great conquerors and lawyers and statesmen come to receive their rewards, the Almighty will turn to Peter and will say, not without a certain envy, when he sees us coming with our books under our arms, 
look, they need no reward. We have nothing to give them here. They have loved reading. <laughs> so the pleasure of reading, Virginia Woolf suggests, may be superior to the joys of the paradise. Thank you. Grazie, Lina. Thank you so much for this fascinating um, talk. You know, whenever I um, hear from you, it's, I mean, I, I, I sort of am reminded of the reasons why I got fascinated with the Renaissance and particularly with this way uh, of looking at this fascinating time period through all the intersections of the various layers which you know, makes the culture of the Renaissance so rich and so resonating both with the past, the ancient past, but also with our own present um, in a way which is of course extremely uh, problematic and uh, challenging to address as you have shown. I know we have began with um, Raskin reading about, um, writing about reading and then Proust rewriting uh, Raskin, and what is interesting there is that it all begins with an effort of translation. So Proust is translating Raskin, and you know he ends up writing even more. So in a way, the reading through the translation act gets to be extremely productive. And then sort of looking retrospectively at what happens with the Studiolo, we have a very similar pattern there because you know what is fascinating, particularly to my eyes is that the Studiolo is not just a collection of bits and pieces, it's not just a collection of portraits and books and objects, but it's really the creature made by someone, which is the, the Duke, right? So we have the person, the, the persona, really, in, a sort of in, in the Latin sense uh, of, of the Duke, um, who is present through the Studiolo, which means through the books, through the objects and through the portraits. Um, and even if the Studiolo to us now is just a bunch of uh, disiecta membra, as you were saying, um, we still have a way to get into um, the Duke's sort of cultural project. So um, um, just a practical um, thing. We have, of course, an, an, a chance for the audience to ask questions to Professor Bolzoni. We have our Q&A function um, open. So please drop questions in the chat. Well, not in the chat, sorry, in the Q&A box um, if you have questions and I'll be happy to um, transfer them on to Professor Bolzoni um, while uh, we wait for the audience to uh, take this opportunity. I would like maybe to um, begin by asking um, one thing um, among the many which I would like to ask. And it's really about the fact that the, the gallery of these illustrious men in the, in the Studiolo includes, interestingly enough, characters from history, characters from, well, figures from uh, literature, poetry, um, theology, of course, um, modern history, but we don't really have mythology. We don't, so it, what seems to be fascinating here is that this collection of illustrious men is really sort of ground in history, uh, in sort of uh, whatever the Duke thought of as, you know, the real facts of history, yeah. right? Um, and these are facts which can be read through books. So uh, it's interesting to think that in a way, mythology in this context is left aside. Um, and uh, the, the, the faces of these, of these people, uh, the, 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 the personae which come up in the Studiolo are really, so to speak, real figures. Of course, many of them um, were sort of reconstructed even biographically to the eyes of, uh, of the Duke. But, you know, this is something which I would like to um, hear more about, this sort of distinction, right, which we seem to see uh, between the domain of fiction, mythology, and then the domain of history, which seems to be so important to a ruler like uh, the Duke of Urbino. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And uh, uh, also, Eugenio, thank you for your uh, notes about translation, how important and how rich is the, import, is the experience of translation in this culture. And uh, yeah, you are right. There is a distinction between mythology and history. And uh, Federico is interested to, uh, to dialogue with the great authors. Maybe uh, 
he can uh, he can dialogue uh, uh, with mythology through through them, but uh, the first uh, um, uh, the first character is the author. <laughs> so uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a very interesting and also uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's interesting also to see. Um, how rich is uh, uh, the presence, for example, the medieval and the contemporary uh, humanistic culture. Uh, it's interesting for me that we can uh, find together some components that usually we are, uh, um, uh, we think uh, as uh, divided parts of the culture. It's a, a very interesting also from this point of view. Yeah. Absolutely. But thank, thank you, Lina. Uh, I will move on to a couple of questions which we have um, in the Q&A box. The first one is from uh, Manu Radhakrishnan, and uh, there are two kind of questions here. Um, the first one is um, about the selection of the portraits and the authorship of the inscriptions, right? Because um, you have been talking about the fact that uh, Federico is behind the inscriptions. And so I think the question is really about to what extent can we talk about authorship in the case of Federico here. And then the other question is um, about the um, uh, portraits themselves. Um, are the faces imaginative productions of the artist or are they based on some sort of other sources? Ah, okay. Uh, so uh, the, first, uh, the first question is about uh, uh, how we know who is the author of the inscription, is it? Okay. Um, okay. We uh, we are almost uh, sure that uh, Federico was the author. I mean, uh, he had a very good uh, humanistic culture. So uh, maybe he, he used someone exactly to write the inscription. But the inspiration is uh, is his own. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, it's not. Uh, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, we we may be uh, sure that uh, he. I mean, he 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 was using the studiolo, uh, and uh, also uh, in uh, his biography we find uh, many uh, many elements that uh, help us to understand how he really was uh, uh, the director of the operation. I mean, he was interested also in the construction. Uh, of the palace, uh, he was interested in uh, uh, in the building, in the architecture. He was interested in, in uh, creating uh, the library. Uh, he was interested uh, in uh, choosing, I think, the authors and the inscription. So, of course, uh, uh, when we read Federico's poetry, Federico's did it. Uh, of course, it's a uh, um, it's a kind of self fashioning you know? it's a kind of political creation of uh, of himself but is uh, but in the same time uh, he also uh, was really interested in the cultural enterprise and uh, the second question um, the second question was about um, the faces of the uh, portraits. Uh -huh. Are they just imaginative creations or were they based on some sort of visual sources or descriptions? Uh, the most part of them, uh, the, the, it was a, a creative and imaginary uh, features of the authors. Yes. And as, a, as a Pliny says, uh, the creation of portraits uh, comes from the desire, <laughs> the desire of uh, of seeing <laughs> of seeing the, the face of the author. Right. Um, then we have a question from Valerie Rees. Um, she says, "I loved your presentation and the way that authors were brought to life um, with specific characteristics." The question is, do you think that Federico was aware that Plato <laughs> had taken an opposite view, that books were dead words which could not answer back? Oh, very interesting. Very interesting question. So uh, maybe, maybe he knew, but uh, uh, I think that the creation of the library, the creation of the studiolo is exactly an answer to this idea. Because uh, 
the uh, yeah the idea of the dialogue with the authors that uh, the portraits uh, uh, makes uh, either is really a kind of answering to this idea of Plato. But we know we know that uh, Plato writes in Phaedrus against the writing, but of course he used the writing. <laughs> he, he, he wrote his dialogues. So also for, uh, for Plato, the, the problem is very complex. But uh, um, I think that for Federico, there is no problem. <laughs> the books speak and they can dialogue with us. But thank you, Valerie, it's a very interesting question. Right, then I will move on to a question from Alessandro Giammei, um, which is also sort of um, asking about something which Alison Cornish has also sort of raised. So I, I, I will go through Alessandro's um, question. Um, Grazie, Lina, as always, it is illuminating to hear from you, even if virtually. And virtuality is something that I wanted to ask you about. So looking at the images of the Studiolo, after um, two plus years of Corona China, Corona scene, I suddenly thought that those portraits now look to me like the screen or a Zoom call, right? So we have all the faces like in a Zoom call. Um, remote <laughs> presences that are virtually together on a wall. And of course, we know that the practice of video calling is very linked with books. People connecting from their own stance or study tend to want books in their backgrounds to show their identity and culture to their interlocutors. And your exercise of reading is, of course, based on a virtual reconstruction of the studiolo, which exists today only virtually. How do you put together the very real and the very virtual nature <laughs> of reading? I don't know, uh, Alessandro. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am, uh, I am studying the magic of reading. So, <laughs> I, I also make a kind of magical, um, uh, yeah, experience. Yeah, it's true. I put to get, but uh, as uh, uh, as Eugenio knows, we come from a strong philological uh, tradition. <laughs> So I think that uh, it's possible to use the philological tradition. I mean, we have documents about uh, portraits, we have documents about inscriptions. So we have instruments to, to put together. But also it's true that now it's a virtual reconstruction of the past. So for me, it's a kind of a new magical action <laughs> as uh, Federico and the other in the, <laughs> in the humanism try to, to realize. But it's uh, interesting because uh, it's true that uh, uh, if we think of Zoom that we are using now, if we think uh, of our new technological instruments, we may also uh, rethink uh, the past in a different way, maybe in a more lively way. I hope so. <laughs> um, thank you, Lina. Then I will just read um, um, Alison's question as well, because yeah. it's true that there's an overlap there, but I think that Alison's questions also brings the discussion one step further. Um, so she writes, uh, how would you translate this experience of reading into a culture that doesn't read or that doesn't read much. Perhaps there is something to learn about seeing books as faces and voices or thinking about knowledge as relationship, personal yeah. relationship. Oh, thank you, Alison, yes. This is a great challenge for us. So uh, I think that uh, also uh, my uh, idea of uh, reconstructing this uh, long and beautiful but ancient tradition of reading as a dialogue. Uh, this idea, uh, it's, uh, I mean, came also from our experience, from our contemporary experience, where we know that many people don't read. Uh, we know that, uh, um, so that uh, yeah, there are people, who don't, young people, but not only young people who don't know the experience of, uh, of reading. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Alison. It's important also uh, to understand that uh, reading can create a community, can create a dialogue. And uh, um, 
If I think, for example, uh, in Italy, but not only in Italy, uh, to the experience of a group of women um, who, uh, who have been living together in order to create a community, to, to create a new identity. So I think that also in our um, more recent experience, we can find very interesting examples of dialogue, of uh, reading as uh, something that can create uh, a community. But it's true that, and I agree with Alison, it's not easy now. It's a problematic issue. Uh, okay, um, then we have a question about the um, gestures of the hands um, in yeah. the portraits uh, from Susan. Um, so uh, you reference the hands of Boethius as suggesting a dialogue. And she's asking whether the uh, mudras position uh, of the hands uh, in the entire collection have been catalogued uh, as to their intentions. So is there a sort of study about the various position and gestures of the hands in the portraits of the studiolo? Yeah, there are some, uh, for example, there is a book, I think, by Keles, but you, you can find uh, the uh, ind indication of a bibli of bibliography in my uh, book, uh, La Meravigliosa Solitudine. And yeah, uh, there are two traditions in, uh, um, uh, I mean, in the scholars that have been interested in this. Uh, there is a more classical tradition who, uh, who reminds, for example, Quintilian, the part of uh, rhetoric of Quintilian about gestures. Uh, of course, it's important, but I think that it's more important the tradition of medieval gestures. And yes, there are, uh, there are uh, a general, um, there are some general study about, uh, about gestures in uh, the medieval paintings. And yeah, there are something more specific about uh, about uh, the gesture in, uh, uh, in the studiolo. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have a question from Ida Cagliazza. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. I was wondering if we know anything about Battista's active, maybe active role in the building of Federico's cultural and intellectual image, or maybe about her own self-fashioning. After all, in her famous portrait, she is reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, she was a, a very cultivated woman. and. Uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, to understand how exactly he uh, she could be important in the construction of the studiolo, uh, and uh, in uh, um, in the double portrait by Piero della Francesca that Ida remembers, uh, she she reads, but uh, also in the same time uh, she is exalted in the inscription uh, that is. Uh, uh, that accompanies uh, uh, her triumph. Uh, she uh, she's remembered uh, only uh, because uh, she is linked uh, uh, to the virtue of uh, uh, her uh, um, uh, her man, <laughs> to the virtue of Federico. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, as always we can think that. Uh, also, Battista was important in this cultural context, but it's very difficult to find uh, uh, more specific elements in order to understand this. Excellent. Um, thank you, Lina, again. Uh, now we have another question uh, from Jenny McPhee, um, and this is about um, possible intersections with graphic novels today. So she's um, asking, perhaps the rapid rise of graphic novels and manga today is to some extent addressing this question of reading and dialogue for the younger generation. So this kind of a follow up on the point made by Alison yeah, uh, yeah. earlier. Yeah, I find uh, very interesting this, uh, this idea, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it's true that uh, uh, our contemporary experience helps us also to uh, to look at a new perspective in a more uh, um, in a more interesting perspective also uh, to this experience of the past. Uh, 
And uh, uh, yeah, we have been uh, working on uh, Dante's, for example, of Dante's fortune, uh, also among uh, comics, uh, among manga. So uh, I think that uh, uh, my interest uh, uh, for the intersection between words and images is also linked to our contemporary experience. And uh, I am very glad that uh, uh, someone <laughs> like uh, this person uh, can think uh, uh, also in a creative way <laughs> uh, to, uh, to this experience. It's a kind of modern reading, <laughs> modern creative reading of this experience. Right. Uh, thank you, Lina. Um, then we have um, one question. Um, I don't see the name of the person, so I won't be able to mention yeah. that, but the question seems extremely interesting as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Bolsonini, for the wonderful presentation. The, this is a question about tradition. As you said, reading is a dialogue with authors, both in the past and in the present. Of course, the gallery of portraits in the Studiolo allows us to see Federico as a persona, but some of the figures seem to be there because of a tradition too, as for example, Plato and Aristotle. So could the tradition be seen as the first dialogue you come in contact with, and then the, perso and, and then the personal taste dialogue comes? In which ways is he, that is the Duke, individualizing the tradition? Yeah, yeah. The tradition is absolutely important because the memory is absolutely important. Of course, uh, it's a memory. It's a selective memory. No, it's a me it's a memory of the great men. No women. No women among, for example, for example. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the idea is exactly uh, what uh, uh, the person who uh, who may uh, make this answer uh, this uh, answer. Um, uh, as a uh, underline, I mean there is a dialogue uh, because uh, it's a per it's a the, uh, it's a person who choices the tradition, and uh, in the dialogue with the tradition uh, creates himself creates uh, yeah it's, it's also something that is a self fashioning. So we have the tradition, the tradition uh, we are in the Quattrocento, so the tradition is. Uh, uh, well uh, um, created is uh, uh, is something that exists in the same in the same time as uh, I try to show uh, Federico chooses his own tradition and choosing his own tradition he creates also his personal uh, um, identity. Right. Thank you. So the question was from Adriana Merenda. She sort of uh, added the name. Uh, uh -huh. and, I think, uh, and I think this is a fascinating point because, you know, the idea of thinking about tradition as an active um, process, of course, yeah. has to do with this idea of, you know, trans, right? I mean, there's something going from one place to another, from one time to another, and you already have there at least two extremes, right? And so they are in a way of a, of a dialogue. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so I think we can certainly think about um, these question in this terms. I think we have um, maybe two more questions. Um, and um, uh, let me get there. Yes. So a question from um, Sarah Proden. Um, Grazie mille. It's always a pleasure to see through your eyes, Lina. I have a question about the experience of reading you described as seeing the face of another in one's own mind. Could you expand on the reader's expectations of such an encounter? Was it simply a matter of coming to know or understand on a deeper level, or was it also understood as a means of personally transformative engagement, one perhaps aimed at self-change? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, if, I, uh, if, I, if I go briefly also uh, the problem uh, of uh, Adriana, uh, yeah, the translation is very is very important, and also uh, we we are. Uh, um, I mean, this this is a tradition in which memory is creative, so <laughs> it's something very different from our idea of memory. But memory is something that is personal and it's uh, it can be creative, and. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, the, uh, the idea of recreating the face of the author is very interesting. And uh, uh, it remembers to me uh, the fortune that in Italy, for example, uh, have the festival of reading. <laughs> so uh, we, we see that uh, many, many people uh, go to the Mantova or Sanzana or Torino where they can meet meet the author. So maybe it's something more com more complex than we can uh, we can conceive. Um, but uh, uh, the idea was uh, the, the answer was very, very rich. Uh, the idea was that uh, it was kind of, it was also a kind of uh, mirroring himself or herself in uh, in the in the creation of the author. Yes. It's a very, it's a very magical experience. It's a kind of revocation in order to uh, to have the possibility of mirroring also yourself. So it's very interesting, and maybe we can rethink of this also, um, also remembering our contemporary experience that is very rich in Italy, but not only in Italy, I think. Right. And also the possibility of self change. So through this experience, we yeah. not simply get in touch with the author, but we are also affected by this encounter, and we are changed um, within ourselves. Which is I think, absolutely yeah. This is the thing. idea of the power of reading uh, that can be dangerous for women, for example, but not only for women. Um, I think we have uh, two final questions, which are actually follow ups on previous points already discussed. Um, uh, again, um, about the portraits, um, you were saying that, uh, of course, the portraits are uh, kind of made um, in a sort of fictional way, right? And uh, uh, they are not uh, based on any specific a model maybe so um uh, the same person um uh, is asking now if there is a documentary evidence about um the ways in which the portraits were made in terms of having or not having specific sources yeah okay the, the situation is different of course because for the modern authors they uh, could use they could do for example medals or uh, drawings uh, the imaginary portraits are, uh, first of all, of the ancient the portraits of the ancient authors. Uh, so uh, there are some study about this, uh, about uh, the different uh, sources of the different portraits. Of course, the situation, as I said, is different uh, in each case. In, in some in some cases, uh, it was possible to use. Uh, some uh, uh, sources, some uh, uh, iconographic sources. In other cases, not. So it, it, they were more imaginary. Right. Um, and then uh, Valerie Rees has um, another uh, question. It has been suggested that not all of Federico's books were copied to the highest standards. Um, uh, yeah. Is this true? Yeah. yeah. Vespasiano da Vistici, yes, yes, it's true, it's true. Uh, I mean, he was very proud of his library, but of course, as you know, there are some colleagues who, <laughs> who, who, uh, who shows that not something is perfect. <laughs> Nessuna right. perfetto. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, which leads me to our, I think, very final uh, comment. This is not a question, but I want to read it because it's really uh, uh, very nice. Again, from Susan. Um, Certainly, if reading can be dangerous for women, as you just say, then the books behind you would lead one to think you are very dangerous. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a wonderful I hope day. so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, then on this note, um, I think we should uh, all be extremely grateful um, uh, to Lina for this fantastic talk and the generosity of the discussion. You really gave us much to think about. Uh, and uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for thank being you. with us today. And thank you all the attendees for 
um, being, uh, being with us in your various locations. We know we have uh, visitors from both sides of the pond. So uh, that's fantastic. Thank and you. Thank, all. You, thank you, Jenny, also. Thank you for wonderful moderation. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Gracias. Everybody. Ciao. A presto, Ciao. spero. <laughs>